Well, hi, I'm Wayne Cannell. I'm with the Invisible Disabilities Association. And we have a great opportunity today to meet with Antarctic Mike. Hmm. Antarctic Mike. Well, we'll learn about why his name is Antarctic Mike. Um, so, Mike, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, maybe why Antarctic. <laughs> well, I grew up in Philly, went to school in Boulder, Colorado, and then my wife and I relocated to San Diego, where we now live, in 1992. I've always been an athlete, but I didn't get into adventure sports until 2005 when I took the first of two trips to the Antarctic. <laughs> and the reason I got hooked on the Antarctic was <laughs> because of a book I had read about five years prior about the story of a guy named Shackleton who was trying to be the first group of people to go across the entire continent on foot. And as soon as I read that story, I transposed the principles of that story and the drivers of that story into the real world. And I thought, this is the kind of company I'd like to work for, the kind of manager I'd like to work for. So I saw the parallel between what they did and what people who are successful today or who are trying to be successful today are, are doing. So tell me about this Antarctic adventure, and I know you've been on some other adventures, too. Kind of share a little bit about those. Yeah, the reason I ended up going to the Antarctic twice and, and running marathons and then an ultra marathon was, the irony is, is it really had nothing to do with cold weather or very little to do with sports. Rather, it was my way of following in the footsteps of these guys a hundred years ago. It was like wow. being in a time machine, you know, going back and thinking about what they experienced. Right. So that when I was talking about their stories today, I would have a different level of conviction and credibility because I've been down there and I know what it's like in part. I mean, a small degree, you know, the difficulty they face. So that's really why I went there. It wasn't like I was this seven continents ultra marathon runner like a lot of the other guys were. I was really down there for being a history fan, a lot of them had nothing, no idea of the history of the continent. They just knew it was another place to run. So well, I went me, for a very different reason. Tell me about some of your other adventures. I know that uh, you're an avid swimmer, uh, you know, you're a bike rider. So it's kind of tell me a little bit about that. And it's not just running, you know, doing that just because you want to do an Ironman. But tell me what some of your other things you're, you've been involved in. Right. I, I you know, I guess... Angela thought, well, Mike will go once and get it out of his system. And <laughs> what she didn't realize was what I also didn't realize in that it really sort of was a spark that started a fire because I really discovered the value of these types of events, not so much in the event itself, but rather in all the training and conditioning that led up to the point where I was actually ready to do it. And I saw the ability to use what I learned in all of the training and preparation in other areas of life that are a lot more important, like you know, building relationships and running my business and you know being married to somebody with a lifetime disability. I mean, those things are a lot more important than you know running marathons and, and doing sporting events. It's all of the discipline it takes to be ready to do those and the transference of that into the real world. That's why I continue to do what I do, because 95% of the value is the training and then going to these places and doing these events is really just really more of a validation that all the training and preparation actually paid off and was worth it. So tell me a little bit about, now I know you live in San Diego, and you're going to go run in the Antarctic. I would have thought you lived in Minnesota or something like that, but how do you train in San Diego for miserably cold weather? Well, that's the question I asked myself after I made the commitment to go. What happened was I ended up calling into a radio show and getting on the air. And when I called in, I didn't know the phone number on the guy's business card was the on-air number. So I ended up on air sort of by accident. And then I hung the phone up and I went, I, I don't live in Canada. I mean, it doesn't get very, I mean, 50 degrees is a cold night here in the winter. So how do you get ready for this? And it wasn't like there was anybody I could call and get advice from. This had never been done. So... I, right away, my instinctive thought, and I still remember this day, this was back like, I don't know, March or, I think it was March of 2005, I literally got the yellow pages out, and I'm like, well, do I look under I for ice, F for freezer? I mean, where do you go? So I just started calling every phone number listed under the word freezer. <laughs> 
Okay, so tell us about the freezer you found. Well, it took about a month and a half to get in the freezer. I mean, I had no idea who I was calling. And the phone call would be like, hey, this is Mike. I'm a big fan of these Antarctic guys, and I signed up for this marathon, and I want to train in your freezer. And this is not a prank phone call. I mean, I'm really serious. <laughs> and you can imagine the reaction on the other end of the line. So, you know, I mean, I had one guy who said, oh, you could train in my freezers if you could fit in them. I make ice machines for hotels, you know. So I'm sitting there going, okay. I didn't even know a uh, frozen warehouse existed. Well, about 30 calls into it, I actually got a, a, a call back from a guy who said, hey, I can't help you, but I know a guy down in San Diego who can. He owns this big cold storage facility. Call him and tell him I sent you. So what happened was I called down there, talked to the gal who answered the phone. She got all excited and said, but I can't give you permission. So I left a voicemail for the manager. His name was Josh. He didn't call me back. So I kept calling him for like a week, and finally I just showed up. I literally knocked on his door with all the gear. I had the balaclava, the goggles, the big parka, and I literally showed up at his front door. Well, it turned out he couldn't give me permission, so he referred me to the ice and wick talk to the owners. So I said, well, great, we're at the office. Let's go talk to him. He goes, no, you don't understand. He doesn't live here. He lives up north of L.A. He's 80 years old. He doesn't speak English. He's ready. He's from Hungary, and he doesn't speak English. And I thought, oh, man, this is going to be... <laughs> this is going to be a challenge. So I hunted this guy down after about a month, and then he uh, turned out he actually let me in the freezers. He actually used to own a business in the Antarctic, he told me. Wow. And I heard this, and I went, what did you do? Sell cars down there? I mean, what did you do? And he goes, no, he had an engineering company that built what was called the closed-loop system for the water and diesel fuel down at the biggest research facility on the continent. Now, you're talking to a guy, Wayne, let me tell you, the reason... Uh, my idea of an engineer, why I didn't apply to the School of Engineering at CU in Boulder, was because I didn't want to drive a train. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, literally. So I didn't know what he was talking about, but I kind of went along with him. like, oh, yeah, I get it. Okay, cool. Let's go. I'll, I'll hang out in the freezer now. <laughs> so the freezer was basically nothing other than a frozen warehouse, and it was only 59 feet long. So, I mean, it was like back and forth and back. I mean, sort of like you've seen those hamsters in the cages and the right. shops that go like this. That's sort of what it was like, only a lot colder. And um, But I loved it. I really liked it because I learned something as a 10-year-old playing hockey. I grew up playing hockey in Philadelphia. And my coach pulled me aside one day and he said, you will play the game the way you practice. If you make the practice harder, the game goes easier. Mm. And he skated wow. away. And I'll never forget that because when I was going like this, all of a sudden, you know, Chronological-wise, I turned the tables back and the time back, and I thought about this when I was 10 years old, and I thought, this is making the practice harder. So I thought, if I can do this, when I get into the real environment, it will be that much easier. And that actually turned out to be the case, because when we went down there and I ran the marathon, I hadn't run a full marathon in 20 years. Well, other than the one I ran in the freezer, I actually ran a marathon in the freezer in preparation, wow. but... I had run a real marathon, you know, outdoors in 20 years, but when, when I ran it, even though it took a little over seven hours, and I finished last out of nine people, which I didn't care, I just wanted to finish, it seemed like it was only seven minutes. I mean, literally, it seemed like it was a lot less time, and I think part of it was because I enjoyed it, but part of it, I think, also was because I made the practice so hard that the event itself was easier relative to the practice, and I really followed his principle and it worked. And I think it works not just for athletes. I think in any environment, if you know your definition of difficulty is here or your limit is here, you actually can change your whole paradigm and your whole definition of what difficulty is or is not. And I don't think a lot of people realize that that is more within their control than they realize. And if they knew that and they knew the payoff, they would do the work it would take to actually raise that ceiling or change that definition. But I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. So everybody's probably wondering as they're listening to this, you know, you know, I know you've swam 102,000 meters in a 25 meter pool and, and you rode a spin bike for something like five days straight, you know, all these, you know, ran in the Antarctic and the, and in Siberia and all these crazy things. But speak about the 59 feet or the 25 meters in the pool because the reality is, 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 uh, how does that impact the life with your wife? And we know that uh, you may share a quick little thing about her story and and really what that expedition and what the real expedition that you've been training for is all about. 
Well, I think part of the key to being able to change your definition of difficulty and change your paradigm is to break the mountain, so to speak, or break the big picture down into smaller bite-sized pieces. I mean, I know it sounds a little bit a little bit coy or maybe a little bit like a cliche, you know, eat the elephant one bite at a time, but I think it's literally true, and I don't know that we do this on a daily basis when it comes to big financial issues, big health issues, school issues, you know, big issues that take a long time that are difficult. I don't think we understand every day how to break that down into very small bite-sized pieces. So take, uh, you know, a 65-mile swim, which is 102,000 meters or 102 kilometers. Part of the reason why I wanted to do it in a lap pool, besides the fact that I didn't want to end up getting lost in the ocean and being halfway to Hawaii, was the fact that, you know, part of the difficulty that I run toward is that monotony, because that's what really trains the mind. And so um, it also helps me because I can break down the big picture. I mean, if you think about 102,000 meters, well, we, in America, we don't think in meters, 65 miles in a lap pool. I mean, that's like unheard of. I mean, right. Olympians don't do that. And so part of my process, though, what I did was I broke that down into sets that were 200 yards long or 200 meters long, which is basically up and back only four times. Because for me, mentally, that's the easiest because the way I group numbers in my head on this, it makes it very easy. And I would literally, so the biggest, the whole point is, is the biggest number I saw in 31 straight hours, because that's how long it took in the pool, the biggest number I saw in 31 hours was only 200 meters. And 200 meters for somebody that works out in the pool is nothing. And that's literally the biggest number I saw. And when we ran the marathon in the Antarctic, uh, we only saw individual miles. We didn't really see, in fact, the, the, hundred, the funny part, too, was on the 100 the, on the 100 kilometer run, which was the second one in Antarctica, it actually was four laps around a mountain pass. Each lap was 15 and a half miles. Well, what I did was I thought, okay, there's four of these. I mean, 15 and a half miles is pretty good distance, especially in those conditions. But what I said to myself was, I said, wait a minute, there's only four of them. I mean, four of anything can't be that difficult, right? Regardless of the distance, there's still only four of them. So I said, well, the first one is a warm up. The second one is the actual event. The third one is a cool down, and the fourth one is a victory lap. So in wow. reality, I only have to run one of them. After I warm up, I only run one, then I cool down, and then it's a victory lap wow. or a celebration lap. So right. literally in my mind, I told myself, I only have to run this mountain one time. Now, ironically, it's going the warm up, the warm down, and the, and the victory lap, given the conditions and the distance, and it took 17 and a half hours to do the one. But it doesn't matter. It was still only one. Right. So how does this translate to... Uh, I, didn't your, get to I, I didn't get to break that stuff down. I think, so how does this translate to, to, yeah, to Angela? I mean, transposing this into the real world. Right. Right. I mean, transposing this into the life... I mean, you know, Angela and I are, are in our mid to late 40s, and we have years to go, and she's got health issues around every corner, but yet we look at it like it's 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 just... One condition at a time we're getting through. If she's making an adjustment on a medication, we're just working with that medication. If it's a kidney issue, we're working on the diet stuff just for the kidney issue to maybe change the creatinine number. You know, it's just we're, we're breaking that big stuff down. We can't think about, well, what about in 10 years? Well, we're going to just think about the next seven days. We're going to think about the next month. We're not going to think about 10 years from now because who knows what's going to happen. So I think that, yes, in, the, in one sense... That stuff's in the back of your mind in the future, but I think it just trains us to break it down into smaller size pieces. And I think also one of the things I learned from Shackleton's story from Antarctic history was he said something very profound. And this is really, really insightful into today's world, and I'll, I'll explain. He told his guys when they were stranded down there in 1914, he said, you know, the biggest threat we face is not the ice, it's not the lack of food, and it's not the temperature. He said the biggest threat we face is the lack of our minds not staying engaged and moving forward at all times. So ironically enough, there's a photograph on a cover of the original book I read about his expedition that basically had a picture of a bunch of them playing soccer, and then in the very right-hand corner of the picture in the background is, is their ship that's stuck in the ice. And as I read the story and I saw that picture, I thought, this is interesting, because the ship in the ice represents a factor that is completely out of their control. 
I mean, that ship is in six feet of ice, right? As good as they are, as hard as they try, they can right. saw their they can saw 24 hours a day and try and get it out. It's not going to move. The soccer game, on the other hand, represents a factor completely within their control, something to keep their minds moving forward. And I thought, here's the power of that photo. It separates the factors that you can't control from right. those that you can't. And then I transpose that into the real world. How many things in the world of finance and school, and in this case we're talking about somebody who's got health problems, well, a lot of things regarding Angela's health we can't change. As well as she eats, as much as she rests, as disciplined as she is, it's not going to move the needle. Whereas we have to say, what are the things we actually can control? And one of the reasons why Angela actually went off dialysis, I mean, her nephrologist said he's only taken two people off of a dialysis machine other than people who died or got a transplant in his whole career, and Angela was one of them. And we really do believe that part of the reason that contributed that is because one of the factors that is critical that a kidney patient has control over is their diet, and it's really critical. And Angela is really fastidious about this diet. Right. I mean, she loved bananas, for example. I mean, ate them to the tune where she was eating more than a monkey in the zoo. I mean, she really liked them. And yet, potassium's a big no-no for a kidney patient. So she literally cut them out. I mean, just stop. I mean, so right. there's examples of where you separate what you can and can't control. And I think the more we do that in the real world, the more we just let a lot, because a lot of pressure that builds in life comes from us pushing against these walls, right, that as good as we are, as hard as we push, you're not going to move them. I mean, save your energy and your time and your resources for the things you can control. There are enough of those, right? They take enough time. So right. let's, you know, let's be smart about it. So yeah, well, all this stuff traces back to, you know, factors, whether you're a marathon runner or whether you're an Antarctic explorer 100 years ago or a kidney patient today. Yeah, you know, as a fellow caregiver, I know you guys have been married uh, over 20 years, and I've almost been married 18 years, and, and I know that the that real journey of caregiving, you know, a lot of times you don't prepare for it, or both of us kind of signed up for it in a sense, although we didn't still know what we're going to get into, and I think that being expedition ready that, you know, we kind of talk about is is that, like you just said, the whole issue of that it's in bite-sized chunks, you know, if you think about 30 years, you can't fathom what 30 years is about. But if you think about it, hey, I can think about today, I can think about this week, you know, I can find ways to uh, to um, help my wife um, just, you know, get through the week. And I think that that's the biggest thing, that whole training issue is that is to really focus on the training and not necessarily the end result of the race. Right. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny because I... Uh I don't really care about the end result in terms of the way most people measure it. You know, the funny thing was somebody asked me when I got back from my first trip to the Antarctic, they said to me, you know, wow, that's pretty amazing, you ran a marathon there. How did you do? What was your time? And I looked at them and I'm like, you realize I just went halfway to the moon and do you really think I care about time? Now, he didn't also understand that, you know, part of my motto as an athlete is I threw the clock in the garbage in 20 years ago and I've never been happier. But this taught me something really interesting because it taught me that, you know, how I define that gold medal can be very different from how the next runner defines it. Even though we're on the same course and we have the same goal as far as the end result, we want to get to the 26-mile mark or the 100K mark or wherever it is, That's we share that goal. But what we differ in is the drivers and the whole reason as to why we're going to endure this. I mean, we had only nine runners in the marathon in the Antarctic. One of the guys was a Russian guy. His goal was, I just want to win. I don't care if it takes me a minute, an hour, a day, a week, a month, a year. I don't care about the time. I just want to be first, regardless of the time. Then we had other people who were like, I just want to finish and be the first person to do, one gal was the first person, first woman in the world to run on all seven continents. I'd write, so that was her goal. And then you got me. I didn't care about time. I didn't care about place. I didn't care about any of this. I didn't care about seven continents. I just wanted to follow in the footsteps of the guys that were down there 100 years ago. See, so how we're all defining that gold medal right. very differently. And I think right. when it comes to pushing people into areas of difficulty, even in terms of like dealing with your health, changing your diet, so you increase your probability of doing better in blood tests and in other things, you have to know, you know, I have to know, how does Angela define the gold medal? She's right. in this marathon, so to speak, that's obviously a different marathon than we're talking about here, but what's her definition of the gold medal? Right, I, I, right. I mean, unless I know that, 
I, I can't really help her, you see? And I think it's the same way, whether you're talking about managing employees, whether you're talking about motivating your kids, helping your spouse, right? right. No matter what the difficulty is, whether it's a school difficulty, a financial difficulty, in this case we're talking about a health difficulty, each person defines that metal differently in their race. And we have to know what that is. We have to help them know what it is. Sometimes we don't even know what our own definition of our own gold medal is. So we really have to help people understand that and manage all the activity and the things around it to fit their definition, not ours or anybody else's. Well, I'll tell you, Mike, I think it's, you, you know, got some great insight, obviously. And, and, uh, you know, what, what's amazing is, is obviously you're in a great health for what you're doing, but you also understand what, what happens is when you have somebody whose health is a challenge every day. And, you know, just like me, my, my wife is the gold medal for me as well. And so t- tell me, just to share with us um, where people can get a hold of you, how they can get a hold of you, your website, your Facebook, you know, those kind of things, because um, we want them to be able to have an opportunity to ask you questions on your journey so you can share insight with them. Pretty easy. If you just go under Google and you put in the keywords Antarctic Mike, it's kind of hard to miss me. There are not a whole lot of us out there. <laughs> You can find me on Facebook under Antarctic Mike. I'm a big LinkedIn guy. I use LinkedIn quite often. My website is AntarcticMike.com. <laughs> it's pretty easy to find me. But I'd be more than happy to um, you know, take questions, comments, thoughts. I'd like to hear other stories, too. I mean, I'm not the only person who has learned a lot of life lessons for really important purposes, you know, through talents and their own interests. I mean, there's a lot of people out there watching this that have different interests different talents, and I think the key is as long as you really apply yourself and look to what you're learning and what you can transfer from that learning into other areas of your life, it makes for a very compelling story, right? Whether it's running or not, Antarctica, cold weather, it doesn't really matter. That's why I always tell people in you know, a lot of the programs where I speak, I say, look, this is not just reserved for people that like cold weather want to follow Shackleton and like to run freezers, because I know that's a very small segment of the population. But it's really just about the individual talents and interests that each of us have, as long as we're really making every effort to push ourselves and grow ourselves in those things and taking what we learn from that and applying it to other areas of life that are a lot more important, uh, then it makes for a very compelling uh, story and example that people can set for us. Well, we hope they, they'll be expedition ready, and I hope that this gives them a good uh, mark on their journey. Thank you so much, Mike. You're welcome. Thanks for having me.